So I'm very happy to have Divya Roy with us um, today. Um, Divya is a well-known scholar from India, um, but he has um, worked for many years in other places, including the US um, and the UK. He is um, an assistant professor at the Indian Institute of Management at um, Indoor. And I have to say that he has made really great and interesting contributions to the field of digital humanities, uh, particularly focusing on new media, uh, in new media studies, um, and of course, theories of masculinity and gender, as you can uh, see from the title of the talk today. But um, Divya has not only published um, um, on gaming, but also on a topic that is quite close to my heart. And I hope, uh, you know, at some point we can have more extended conversations with him about this. Uh, this is to say the colonial approaches to digital humanities. And in addition to that, um, he is one of the founding members, um, but I will also say very much a central figure of DARTI, um, which is the Digital Humanities Alliance um, or for Research and Teaching Innovations in India. So uh, Divya, welcome, um, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And I hope I'm audible and visible, Patty. I'm just... Uh, the tech part is something that I always like to check. Yes. OK, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It has genuinely been I've known Patty for through 30 and we have a WhatsApp group because, you know, WhatsApp is the ubiquitous social media group for South Asia. And I've known so many scholars from across the world, intersectional scholars across the world who work on many intersectional issues. And it's been an absolute privilege and getting to know of Patty's fantastic work Deborah's work and the work that Lancaster University is doing. So it's an absolute privilege to speak at the Hangouts. We'll talk a little bit about the topic and then talk a little bit about Dharti. And uh, then we're going to go into the uh, overall talk today. So as you can see, the talk is titled Reclaiming the White Woman from the White Man for the Brown Man, Anxious Indian Masculinity in Online Video Games. So for all of you, most of you must be aware that this is basically sort of a take or maybe a slightly flippant take on what Spivak says in Can the Subaltern Speak, where she talks of one of the main strategies of colonialism is the white man saving the brown woman from the brown man. So I hope during the course of this talk, this flippant take on that uh, very well-known comment becomes clear. So as uh, Patty has very kindly mentioned, I am very privileged to be one of the co-founders of the Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovations. And I'll just take about 30, 35 seconds to briefly introduce what Digital Humanities Alliance uh, for Research and Teaching Innovations in India 30 stands for. So uh, again, um, I want to make sure that we understand that DH in India is very rhizomatic. It is sort of a some association of heterogeneities. But in 2016, many of us like-minded scholars and people in India got together for an informal chat and we decided to form a collective and an alliance. You know, DH has work has been happening in India on, in another dif on, on, under different names, probably uh, for a long while, but we thought it was time to have a national conversation. I was very privileged to have my colleague, Professor Nirmala Menon at IIT Indore, uh, which is in the same same place that I decided to you know, sort of to the open CFP based national conference. So while smaller initiatives had been taking place, uh, an open CFP based conference had not happened in India in DH before. So that happened in June 2018. And we were at that point of time called Digital Humanities Alliance of India. And we had participation from 15 Indian states and five countries, which really made us aware of the kind, the gamut of work through all the sort of different areas of digital humanities that we can talk about. And I broadly look at, so one of the definitional debates in digital humanities is trying to find out a DH definition. I personally don't believe that we need to have a definition, but if we really want to have one, then we can think of digital tools, techniques, and objects. And I, if you map in that sense, there's a computational humanist, the digital archivist, total cultural school. So I've been fortunate enough to inhabit all three areas, but I realized after that conference that there are so many interstices and overlaps that India is working with and Indian DH is working with. Right. So then uh, there was uh, a growth period and our WhatsApp group started, which has been phenomenal over, uh, you know, 200 scholars who are there. And there's also a Slack, SIG, uh, Slack group right now. 
So in 2018, we were uh, we renamed to 30, which is the Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovations, which was both for uh, bureaucratic reasons, but we also felt that this new name gives us a larger ambit. And then in Jan 2020, just before the pandemic hit, we were uh, you know clairvoyant to organize the first Twitter conference on DH in, in India. And that was a fantastic success as well. So this is a brief background. I'm happy to talk more about this again. I'm very privileged to be one of the one of the co-founders of 30, but also there are so many wonderful scholars doing amazing work. And I hope that this conversation allows us to talk about some of them. And uh, for today, I'm going to talk about my role as a game studies scholar, and that is an accidental role. So I was in, in during my time as a PhD scholar in the US, my PhD advisor asked me to join a project on computer gaming across cultures. I was not, not a gamer at all, um, but then I was on this project where we had to play World of Warcraft. And they told me that in World of Warcraft, you can pick up roles and avatars where you don't have to kill kill people. I was not very fond of that. So then I decided to become a priest of the paladin class. And the first thing that they did was they handed me a sword and asked me to go and kill a mana worm. So I realized that you can't escape killing. And that's when I started realizing, can I really escape killing? Can I do everyday things in the World of Warcraft space and level up? And I decided I could do that. So that became one of my first publications in game studies, but I still and I have had a few more, but I, I still call myself a very accidental locational game studies scholar. So please take my scholarship today from that that perspective. I'm happy to engage on any of the points raised. So today, before beginning, I want to give you a brief perspective on what the Indian gaming space looks like. So the Indian gaming space is a largely mobile based gaming space. And that has also happened because for the last couple of years, uh, we have had a data revolution in this country. Data prices due to the um, due to, due to the entry of a, co a company called Geo has gone down hugely. So mobiles have mobile cheap mobiles as well as cheap data packs have made uh, you know mobile gaming ubiquitous across the space. And as you can see, this is a 2020 article where it says mobile gaming is one of the fastest growing industries in India. And of course, the pandemic has only exacerbated this. This phenomena, as you can see, this is an uh, article from the Mint, which is a well-known uh, publication in the country, which says the Statista estimates that we India will make about 2.4 billion dollars the mobile gaming market, which is up from 600 million in 2017. That's like a four-time increase in less than three years. So that's quite uh, that's quite amazing, right? In, in the sense of how much how much it's growing. And as you can see, mobile gamers in India typically spend an hour on their device each day. This is higher than the average time they spend on Netflix or any streaming platform, right? So this is this is this is all of that information that's hopefully going to give you some context. But if you've looked at the gaming space, you also need to understand who are the gamers. You know, who are who are the people who are gaming, right? So um, this is a, an article which says the ten most popular Indian gamers who inspired the community. Right. So if it's already not apparent to you all of them are men right so it's 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 quite quite uh, visible that the gaming space is a very gendered space and this might be true for all of the uh, most of the world but in india this is this is almost very skewed for a for a gaming community that's completely male oriented so this gendered gaming space just to give you some numbers so out of sort of 566 million internet users an estimated 549 million users use their internet solely on mobile devices even this has a skew only 38 percent of women use mobile phones while it's 71 percent for men so you can keep you understand how it's getting skewed in favor of men over and over again more importantly when you look at rural users versus may uh, you know urban uh, internet users the number of proportion of male internet users in rural india which has more number of users currently is more than double so again it becomes far more in favor of male gamers or male internet users and finally that number that clinches it right there's only 18 percent of online gamers in india are female so under this sort of uh, episteme ontological sort of setup let's let's try and find out what kind of gaming platforms are visible in this country right so if it's a very gendered space Let's let's see what kind of gaming platforms are available. So Zapac.com is the gaming platform that we'll be looking at today. Zapac.com is India's oldest and uh, most popular gaming site by the number of daily daily users. Um, so it's again a very mobile-centered, flash-based gaming site. And as you can see on this screenshot, 
get it on google play it has a google play app which is very popular over 100 billion uh, downloads and received an estimated average of 173000 visitors between the months of september 2018 and 2019 this number has obviously gone up over the pandemic okay so on this website if you go there's the usual cricket racing action arcade girls top 100 uh, right so girls is not usual i'll come to that so the other cricket racing action arcade are sort of you know, they are uh, ripoffs of paradigmatic American games like Counter Sky or, uh, you know, Need for Speed. So they have these cheap sort of knockoffs of these uh, uh, games on a flash based platform. But as you have seen, there's a particular category called girls games, right? So on the, under these girls games, there are some top rated games. These are called cookery class, yoga teacher, you know, my wedding and uh, sleeping at the meeting. And as a, as a gamer, you would imagine that you know, even if an occasional gamer, because casual mobile game is usually occasional casual gamers, you would imagine that this is someone, uh, all of these games would have different gameplays. Unfortunately not, right? All of the different game choices under this girls games category, the ludic objective or the, as, as you know, the word ludic objective or the gaming objective for all of them is surprisingly similar, right? The gamer is invited to dress and undress white women as they prepare a young college going girl. So I'm going to talk about the different contexts. So this, the ludic objective remains similar. The context might differ slightly here and there, right? So there's one game, three games I'm going to talk in, in, in this presentation or in this talk, which is sleep, uh, sleeping at the meeting, zombie pirate and uh, yoga teacher. But so if I take, for example, this uh, game called sleeping at the meeting, it's a game where you need to dress a woman attractively and a white woman so that people concentrate on her dress instead of noticing her sleep, right? So I'll leave you with that and I'll come back to it a little later. So hopefully we recognize how problematic it is. But let's let's sort of begin with that idea, right? So these are some of the key provocations and these are provocations that we can go on talking about, but just for the purpose of today's talk, these are the key provocations we're going to talk about. How do such digital platforms configure the Indian male's gaming habits? Do such online habits offer any insights into aspirational post-colonial masculinity? And this idea of aspirational post-colonial masculinity hopefully will become clearer as we go ahead in the presentation. Right. So one of the things that upfront as a person who does game analysis, you would try to analyze these games through Kaleha six point framework for digital gaming, which talks of macro involvement and micro involvement. Unfortunately, this framework completely fails because there's nothing, there's neither ludic nor narratological elements that you can actually analyze in these games. There's no content, right? So what do we do? So then I looked at some of game scholars who have worked in post colonial spaces and I want to mention two extraordinary scholars who've been doing fantastic work in the Indian and post colonial space, Professor Shaubik Mukherjee, who's also a friend and a colleague, who, who, who talks about how video games construct conceptions of spatiality, political systems, ethics and society that are often deeply imbued with colonialism, right? And that's a very important departure point for the kind of work that I've been doing. And uh, Professor Aditya Deshbandhu is a colleague and a collaborator, in fact, He's been helping me with uh, working, understanding this project. And we have this paper coming out in Gender, Place and Culture with the collab collaboration with him, who in his recent book talks about how the subjectivities of the players are actively remediated and based within the social realities. So game studies usually has one or two approaches, right? This binary approach, right? You either look at how the gameplay is done or what is the effect of the game. But for this kind of games, though, that kind of binary approach is not going to help us. What we need is actually to understand hegemonic masculinity. And what is hegemonic masculinity? It is understood as the currently most honored way of being a man, which requires all other men to position themselves in relation to it. And it ideologically legitimates the global subordination of women to men. Now, normative models of, and you can say, see on the left, there's a, a small visual which talks about how hegemonic masculinity falls in the overall circle, starts out from patriarchal society or, you know, goes to hegemonic masculinity, gender socialization, power inequality, social health inequality, and social reproduction of patriarchy, right? But the important part is this hegemonic masculinity is not a violent physical phenomenon only. It is done mostly through cultures, institutions, and practices. And as we can understand, video games are very important cultural artifacts. And considering the number of gamers that we just saw, uh, this becomes a very important way to understand both the social and the cultural context of that particular space, right? So from the scholarship and the literature review, this is something that 
became apparent that Indian gaming must be seen as a conversation space between digitality and colonialism. And in this case, I define digitality as the realization of the digital in a particular context. And this is important, right? So to understand Indian gaming through digital and, and its conversations with both digitality and colonialism, I'm using post-colonial masculinity as the heuristic. So basically, post-colonial ma masculinity becomes the heuristic through which these representative games, which are chosen through a case study methodology, are examined to conceptualize the relationship between digitality and colonialism. Now, to give you an overview, uh, the project examined the strategic ideologies behind the production, circulation, and manifestation of these digital artifacts demonstrated that, uh, that these games promote specific models of aspirational Indian masculinity predicated on reclaiming the white woman from the white man for the brown man in a perverted reversal of the post-colonial male's anxiety about the white man saving the brown woman from the brown man. So on the first picture on your left, that's a picture or representation of Auda from around the world in 80 days, Phileas Fogg, if you remember, he saved Auda from Sati, which is kind of the perfect example of the white man saving the brown woman from the brown man. And on the left is a picture from the Oscar nominated movie Lagan, where uh, the main character, Bhuvan, who's a farmer in British times, dreams of going on a date or a dance date with a white uh, ruling class, ruling class uh, white woman, right? So this kind of anxiety has been there in the Indian space and we sort of deconstructed today. Right. So that requires us to do a brief history of Indian masculinity. Right. This is very interesting because um, masculinity and nationalism and colonialism are absolutely interconnected in the Indian context. It's connected in most contexts, but at least in the Indian context, the subordination of colon colonized masculinities by the British imperialists was aimed at challenging the self-governing capabilities of the native subject. And what would that have that do? That would essentially legitimize why the British imperialists needed to exist in the subcontinent. So that that was the key reason why masculinity became obviously it's a it's a location of power. So subordinating native masculinities would be very crucial to legitimizing the imperial project. There are two uh, scholars, scholars and two books that I want to reference, which are fantastic interventions, which is obviously Mirani Nisina's Colonial Masculinity, which is the manly Englishman and the effeminate Bengali. And then this is Rohit Das Gupta and Mokti uh, Mokti. Uh, Moti Gokul Singh's Masculinity and its Challenges in India, which, is a fan, which has a group of fantastic essays on tracing the role of Indian masculinity over the time. So masculinity studies is still quite growing in India, but these are some of the scholars that I really, really enjoy reading and I feel they give us a fantastic perspective. So now that we know this, we have to now find out what did the British do with uh, colonial masculinities. So they actually broke them into this binary. So on one side of the binary was the Bengali intellectual, who, who was sort of the uh, intellectual threat to the British imperial strategies and policies. And he was discursively emasculated, right? He posed sort of, um, even though the British tried to claim that he was the sort of intellectual Bengali was just an effete, effeminate, so was discursively emasculated. By the way, um, this is what Lord Macaulay claimed about the Bengali. This is called the Bangali Babu, that's in Bangla. And it means the Bengali gentleman or the Bhadralok. And this comes through in Dipesh Chakraborty scholarship as well, the Bangali Bhadralok. So this is what Lord Macaulay claimed. He says, the Bengali Babu is feeble to effeminacy. He lives in constant vapor bath. His persuades are sedentary. His limbs delicate. His movements languid. And the, on the up, opposite end of the native male spectrum was the standard hyper-masculine, -mas, hyper hyper-sexualized, degenerate native tribal within Radiat Kipling's model of the half-devil, half-child. So you realize what has happened. There are two binaries being created. On one hand is the intellectual but effete Bang uh, Bengali intellectual who represents the social and political threat. So he has been discursively emasculated. And on the other hand is the barbaric, hyper-sexualized, degenerate tribal man who's not an intellectual threat. So in the middle is the imperial man or the British male colonizer, who's the best of both worlds and therefore justified to rule over India and the subcontinent. So as you can see, a hierarchy of racialized masculinities, and this is not just true for India, but most colon colonial uh, places in during the British rule, uh, a hierarchy of racialized masculinities emerge based on degrees of manliness and effeminacy. Now, what happens then in the post-independence era? Right. So this anxiety gets inbuilt into the native masculine psyche. Now, in the post-colonial Indian era, after independence, that there was a concerted effort to rescue an overtly heterosexual Indian male hero. Right. And this is uh, taken from Sanjay Srivastava's fantastic essay called The Five-Year Plan of Masculinity, where he talks about how post-independence India started having a five-year plan. So in the first five-year plan, 
on your left is a picture of homi bhaba who was father of the indian nuclear project and represented the scientist who was reclaiming science from the colonial masters for the newly independent uh, post colonial south and on the right hand side is amitabh bachchan who is a bollywood figure as you know this is a clip from the movie uh, diwar where he actually starts out as being this hyper hyper masculine hyper virile uh, kuri right someone who's a manual laborer and then he transforms into a post colonial elite okay so now you are trying to get that figure which would both challenge the epistemic as well as the masculine virility of the british male colonizer so this kind of anxiety about masculinity is not atypical right of of uh, only india right it's typical of spaces like india where uh, in in the subcontinent especially and refers to the attempt to remake the recalcitrant clay of plural civilizations because all of us who work in masculinity or uh, you know theories of gender we know that there is no one masculinity there's masculinities and femininities but in a post colonial state you attempt to remake the recalcitrant clay of plural civilizations into lean uniform hyper masculine and disciplined nation states by the way this is the great khali which when he went to world war uh, you know world wrestling federation or world wrestling entertainment as it's known now there was a huge halabalu because it was the first time there was the indian wrestler had sort of gone to the anglo american space right there was gama before that but this is in the new, in the sort of new imperialist stage is the first one now so now we come to the games right so for the paucity of times i'll do a quick analysis you've got most of the background but i'll just talk a little bit about the game play here so the three games i have chosen are sleeping at the meeting yoga teacher and zombie pilot now um, the game play for all of this is very similar right so on the left hand side this is not how the screen looks like i've taken screenshots and put them together so on the first side is basically when you start the game there's a wheel on the top there's a there's a wheel on top which contains uh, you know clothing items or makeup items and there's a game description so for for example sleeping at the meeting as i've already told you is that a woman needs to sleep so that you need, she can not work and you need to dress her attractively so that people don't notice and as um, on the next game is yoga teacher where you need to dress a white woman in elastic fashionable clothes so that she can do yoga and the last one is zombie pirate now that sounds quite uh, you know sort of non normative right that a zombie pirate is someone who go beyond the reductive binaries but actually when you read the game description you will realize the game description says that this is a college girl who's going to a you know fashion parade or a prom party and you just need to give her some makeup tips so this is basically the banic pixie dream girl stereotype which is being used but let's let's just focus on the gameplay for once so what is to be noted here is that the disappearance of the character's clothing happens simultaneous to the male gamer fixing his gaze on the screen suggesting a consensual willingness on part of the white woman character to participate in this enterprise of being dressed and undressed by the gamer usually an indian man because that's the structure that we are working within now so why is this white woman being used here and that's because the white woman was a very effective trope used by colonizers in othering native masculinities right so victorian ideas of repressed sexuality were used and a virtuous caucasian woman was being created who was always under threat from the native uh, from either the intellectual man as well as the hyper hyper sexualized degenerate native tribe so what happens this kind of gameplay reflects fetishistic scopophilia and i'm borrowing from laura malvey's language here where you try to escape masculine anxiety through substituting a fetish object for the anxiety so as you can understand through a very distorted questioning of the imperial narrative all three games focus a voyeuristic male gaze on the white woman's body as an extremely problematic strategy of addressing indian masculine anxiety and this is an aspirational post colonial male anxiety right because you're trying to go beyond those um, binaries that we have put put with it so that's an as that's the aspirational part coming in right so now from that that fetishization of the white woman if you thought it was just going to stay limited to that you are in for a shock right this is the fourth game i chose which is uh, atypical but it continues the same kind of reductive stereotyping in a different but culturally significant site of bollywood this is called bipasha's beach blades so the main character is a very well known popular uh, bollywood star called bipasha basu who is very known for saying very strong female characters so what is this gameplay so bipasha's beach play is a game where bipasha races against aggressors or speedsters and i'm going to explain that in a few moment across beaches across the world and these aggressors or speedsters are the gameplay that you will be you'll either be a aggressor who tries to stop bipasha by throwing objects at her from the beach 
and I know it's ridiculous, but just stay with me. Or you are going to be a speedster who really tries to just go faster than her, right? So the only tool or object that Bipasha can can use to defend herself are bikini tops that appear within the game, right? That's the only thing she has. And the second, one of her main another obstacle in the game is shown to be her feminine sentimentality. How that she has a dog called Poshto. Poshto means opium. And uh, suddenly, sometimes she remembers Posto, as you can see on the screenshot, and she just stops right in her tracks, right? She can't progress anymore, right? And this is very atypical of the kind of characters that Vipasha Basu plays on screen, right? So this is this also, also represents the kind of kind of attitude of postcolonial masculinity or the, the anxieties of postcolonial masculinity. On one hand, was the fetishization of the white woman, and on the other hand, Vipasha represents the kind of empowered postcolonial femininity that would challenge. The aggression or the speed of postcolonial ma manhood, right? So in both ways, this is a quelling of that. So the model of Vipasha, and I'm happy to talk more about this because this requires, you know, I've analyzed this at substantial length in the larger paper. But I'm happy to talk more about this. But just as an as a gesture, just see how problematic this is. The model of Vipasha's speech play seems to be that any challenge or anxiety directed towards aspirational models of hegemonic Indian masculinity from empowered post-colonial femininity will be effectively quelled through aggressors or speedsters, right? So because we have limited time, I'm just going to sort of uh, conclude and try and have conversations. So what is the conclusion and what is the path forward, right? So one of the interesting things is that Flash, obviously, as you know, post-December 20, um, Flash is not going to be available anymore. So I'm hoping that these games will stop being there on Zapac. But one thing we understand very clearly is that Zapac not only enables online sexism, but also becomes a representative digital space where anxious as aspirational performance of postcolonial masculinity that has its historical basis in India's colonial legacy can be materialized. And I do want to make sure that we understand that video games by nature are techno masculine sites where the functioning gays, and this has been talked about by Derek Burdell in his book, you know, Die Trying video games masculinity that by nature anyone who plays video games most video games comes into a techno masculine site where irrespective of the gender the, the gaze is actually masculine but zapac.com takes it a step further right so we have to also recognize that you know i recognize that games are wonderful artifacts that help us break social and cultural barriers in cyberspace but as nakabura says they can also legitimate hegemonic and heteronormative models of racialist masculinity and still find large-scale legitimation in online spaces. So if this is where we are at, is there no hope? Well, there is, right? So the hope is that there will be a synergy between academia, gaming industry and the players, which is slowly gaining traction across the world. And we'll see the economies and geographies of gaming as contiguous and vibrant part participatory cultures. And we have wonderful examples of that. So this is, um, you know, three, three wonderful, um, and I, I know I'm very privileged to know uh, Padmini, Padmini Re Mare, Joel Johnson and KV Ketan built this game called Darshan Diversion, uh, which was actually started about two years before the Sabarimala uh, temple controversy. As you know, the Sabarimala is a temple in Kerala where menstruating women were not allowed to enter. And this game was actually built on that narrative and uh, use that. So this is a wonderful example of how gaming can actually become a positive reinf reinforcement of positive ideas of breaking down of social cultural taboo. So that's the hope, right? There'll be more games like this. And Dr. Remare is an academic um, who's also worked with the industry. So this, and there are wonderful, there are many other scholars who are doing this. There's a lot of hope as hopefully that we are limited time. I'm going to pause and I'm going to take questions and I'm going to stop sharing screen. That's great, Divya. Thank you very much. Um, that was really, really fantastic. I mean, really interesting from so many different perspectives. Um, I think there are not that many questions on the chat. So if ever, if anyone has a, a question that we we'll just to, you know, uh, 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 share with the group, uh, just feel free to ask anyway. Um, so um, I think the very first question is by Ben. Um, he's asking, um, are these games, and I think he was referring to the ones that you show at the beginning, uh, developed by companies in India or by Western companies for the Indian market? That's a great That's question, a great Ben. Question. I think uh, I really question because right. 
the first three games i showed you are actually games that are developed by other companies but zapack.com took these games and inserted them into the indian market which which is actually very fascinating because it tells you what kind of requirements the indian market has and since it has only 18% female gamers why would you have a separate category of of such games wouldn't so that's that's a great question i think when that's an area of further interrogation i'm very interested and the bipasha's beach base that game ben was actually developed in conversation with bipasha basu so that was a completely indigenous developed by zapack.com so that's something that's very interesting and i and i and i like that productive tension so i'm i'm very interested in what happens after that so these dress up games are quite common across the world as you ben you correctly noted but the insertion of that game into the digital context of india and with this specific space is what i am interested in i hope it sort of sort of addresses some of the points yeah yeah no absolutely that's that's really interesting divya um i was wondering also regarding that um i mean just uh, following up a bit um that thought um what about historical games for instance obviously there is um i have had um i i have a lot of uh, friends that are gamers and gamers of all sorts of games not not only computer games and so on um but we we often have quite a lot of good discussions on what makes a good game for instance and many people like historical games but um the majority of them i will say that uh, they tend to gravitate to a kind of like imperial nostalgia or in some way or another you know like whether it is um either you know a, a, a western empire or maybe even the aztec empire there are games for instance about the aztec empire and things like that but imperial i will say thinking and nostalgia uh, tends to draw quite a lot of attention to people do you find that as well in india um i i think that question that would be better answered by professor shobhik mukherjee who's also joined the chat because he works on video games and colonialism but i think for me i actually believe that the imperial nostalgia is not only there in the indian space in fact in the larger uh, uh, project i talk about this so there was this one adult game in the us called general custer's revenge which was on the atari system which was actually a very problematic game about general custer actually sexually assaulting native american women so the point is Uh, what i'm trying to talk, talk about here is that in other spaces these games would probably focus as you know adult games i don't have a problem with that genre but trying to make this girls games and making young girls play these games is is the uh, hopefully the what they are requiring and that becomes very problematic for them right why would you do that but i completely agree with you that uh, sort of imperial nostalgia and uh, and that's there i think in multiple lara croft had that call of duty has had that uh, modern warfare has had that so i think that kind of i think more than imperial nostalgia if i might say so it's a masculine nostalgia it's it's a very male nostalgia of power right so and because power is associated with whiteness in my country largely that that never becomes two separate categories they're always interlinked categories right so that 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 thing um, that thing would be would be very very uh, i think very important is yes, i think uh, shobhik has also pointed that adrian show has a very interesting analysis of caster's revenge game yes i i i also read that and some it's a very interesting uh, very interesting thing yeah and i think uh, there are a few more questions uh, uh yes did yeah do you want to read them yourself or should i continue just i was just wondering whether you have access oh, to the i don't want to burden you i can read them and i can just uh, yeah, no for it yeah yeah uh, so i think uh, yeah i have um, yeah shobhi mukherjee's work is great i completely agree debra and shobhi is here so we learn every day from also um, aditya who's my colleague and we are writing a paper together he's also someone should also look at um, riana says fetishistic scopophilia is my new favorite phrase <laughs> it's funny and um, so Patty, one question you ask is people usually argue that gaming is for fun, but as you demonstrate, it can perpetuate terrible narratives of objectification and racialization, as other media does. I know there is no simple answer to this, but according to you, what have you studied? What are ways forward to decolonize gaming apart from asking the whole world to change its ways? Of course, um, Patty, I think it's about making people like us play. We are not we are not regular gamers. We don't have big you know. 
that that's one of the reasons that mobile gaming is so popular in this country because playstation or a or a, or a powerful console might not be that accessible so we have to ensure that mobile gaming is very democratic that's my point mobile gaming i i think that's my main emphasis if because i teach at a management school and often when we have the discussion i keep pushing forward that mobile game needs to be the best right in india because the powerful um, you know the, the the console games obviously are going to be there and there's a lot of choice and most console gamers are pretty discerning people in most cases but as you saw from those you know the picture of those 10 powerful gamers there are 10 males okay so um, that that troubles me so in fact I, i don't believe that female gamers are not existent in this country honestly i believe from an industry perspective this is a place to make enormous amounts of money right this is a place to make enormous amounts of money by just tapping into that market so i personally focus on um, an idea of mobile gaming and a focus on mobile gaming which is um, which asks for conversations between academia as you know darshan diversion had a mobile gaming platform as well so i think tampon run was another game uh, that was also uh, a, a, a good game in in that context so i think that's something i would i would strongly i, I don't have a steady answer i'm i'm sorry but i think those are some uh, strategies i would definitely think of that that's um, great divya yeah, many many thanks um try right. um should i take the next question pat um so i think uh, shavik has asked gorov has asked i uh, heard a lot about the sabri mala again sarn searched for it um gorov uh, please write to me offline i'll put you in touch with padmini who's a friend more than happy to uh, more than happy to sort of help you out there absolutely right um uh, professor mukherjee shobik das here so so wondering if you have any data about women playing these games i'm thinking of both indian and non that's a great question so the last data set i have from august 2020 is 18% of female gamers are there in india so i'm guessing there are very few women at all if they are playing these games and um, i think there's a large scale that's one of the projects i've proposed a large scale survey of who plays these games but obviously the funding requirement is also also necessary so i want to do a a, a tier 1 versus tier 2 city approach so tier 1 cities in india would be Cal calcutta bombay uh, chennai and these places and then a tier 2 city for example i am in a tier 2 city like indore and i want to see how gaming practices work there so that's something that i'm very interested in so uh, shavika if you are interested please let's collaborate and do something on that so i would be love to do that and um i think uh, riana says gaming is quite a male dominated space is it possible that women are deliberately kept out i'm thinking like gamer gate in the usa um riana i honestly don't know the yes the deliberate part of it is definitely there because you know there's a wonderful essay by lohan and faulkner which i'm happy to send to patty it's called masculinities and technologies right so that actually talks about how important technological decisions are mostly taken by men and that's why and there's nothing inherently masculine about technology right that's a created social condition project because you know my phd was on the nuclear bomb and there's one particular line from um, a scholar that i really like alex wellerstein who said that the politics of the bomb is not in its wiring diagram and for the same way i would say the politics of the gaming is not gaming is made masculine right by the practices by the people who dominate those decisions so i completely agree that there is a deliberate decision of course with the gamer gate which was terrible right with all of the things that keeps happening and even in the indian space the kind of trolling that a uh, female users of social media get i'm not even going into gaming like female users of so social media the kind of hate they get it seems like social media is also a privilege that would be only be for men that seems like some of the case at some points of time so i think that's a very valid point and i would have love to sort of talk more about this yeah patty i think uh, most questions have been um yeah i was you know i was wondering about this last point that you were um talking about um just thinking for instance of the industry right like the many parts that come together in a way to create a game um you have storytellers you have obviously the developers as well you have artists too and funnily enough for instance world of warcraft has a remarkable number 
of women that actually contributes to the art of it, but not necessarily to the narratives, I guess. And that's something that I don't know, but um, because I do painting and so on, I, I, I like very much to follow um, this kind of thing. And I have noticed, for instance, that in World of Warcraft, and that's an interesting thing. So um, I was wondering about whether also thinking in terms um, of the different components that come together in order to create a game, um, introducing women as well, might be another way forward um, to change the perspectives behind. Um, I don't know. I was just wondering whether you have some thoughts on that. No, I, I completely. Uh, sorry, I think somebody else wants to join in. Yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, I would love to take because there are a lot of gamers in the in the conversation as well. So um, I think personally that you know the idea of and Patty, you know this uh, having worked uh, patriarchy. Of course, is not only propagated by males, right? Patriarchy is as much in, embedded in feminine subjectivity. So I think the industry plays a very important role. So even if we have allies in the industry who who would help the voices, as you rightly pointed out, so. They don't have much say in the narrative aspect of things. So, for example, um, the, the as you rightly pointed out, games need to have narratives that are also empowering. The narrative cannot be, it's not just the representation. The narrative, so both the ludology as well as the narratology of it needs to be empowering. So I think that's where we are losing out. And I think that's where academics or people from academia can come in with so much. Because, you know, I, I love that, I love that uh, idea of, you know what are what are stories stories are data with soul right so you know we need to have those kind of stories right that are data with the soul so i think that's important so that's something that um, and it's it's difficult but i i'm very happy to tell you that um, uh, national institute of design for example in india and i was very fortunate last year to be able to speak to a few colleagues from national institute of design who work on gaming and they 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 feel that there's a shift in the industry right now that there's a shift towards making games that are strong in narratives, even from the Indian uh, Indian perspective. Okay, so I think there's there's hope. <laughs> Eternally an optimist, Patty. So I'm just hoping things are going to get better. <laughs> that's that's really my uh, sort of uh, hope and answer at this point of time. No, I think that's fantastic, Divya. Um, yeah, I'm also a hopeful person, so <laughs> that's really great. Um, I think. Um, uh, where else we have uh, here? We have uh, a last question here by Ryan, uh, by Rihanna. Can you see it? Yes. Are any of these games designed by women? If so, how do they differ from games designed by men in India? Rihanna, I don't, I don't think Vipasha's Beach Blaze had any uh, female participation in making that game. In fact, there was, it was quite well publicized. I think Vipasha Vasu was the only female person on that entire stage during the entire process. So. It is extremely a uh, masculine space, which has uh, very few uh, participants in, within that. But uh, if you just search online, you will see that, you know, people who are shattering the stereotypes is a very common article trope nowadays. So you have six female gamers who will be profiled and talked about as breaking the stereotype, right? And then again, you will see these, these women come from elements of privilege. They come from urban cities. So that's an area I am willing to also interrogate, right? Where do those female gamers come from? What kind of games are they playing? Are they playing those games because they see games as empowering or are they playing games because it's again going to that same techno masculine gaze? Because then there is no progress, right? So then that's, if it's not embedded, if that element of masculinity is not challenged on an everyday basis, I would rather have, uh, you know, uh, games that have a powerful empowering narrative, right? rather than having only women play. So, so I think uh, while the subjectivity is important, it's also important what kind of games are we playing? So that's something, and I think that's a very key question. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's really, really interesting, Vivia. Um, thank you so much. Um, so um, I was just thinking, if there is no other question that you want to raise, um, we are going to let you go, Divya, because I do know that it must be quite late back home. <laughs> so, um, so that's uh, that has been, you know, just fantastic and great food for thought. Uh, thank you very much, also to you know, for joining us and being the our first 
um, session, you know, for, for the BH Hangout. And um, so enjoy the rest of your day and your night. And we will see you next time. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. And I want to thank everyone who joined in and for asking those questions because we don't know all the answers. The questions you're asking helps us understand and uh, where we are headed. So thank you, everyone. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care, Patty. Take care. All thank you. Bye.